Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History of Fangirl podcast. This is episode 33, Belfast and the Troubles. Belfast is many different things to different people. It's the second largest city on the island of Ireland, but it's also the capital of Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. With Brexit looming, Belfast's dual role as both Irish and part of the UK seems more tenuous than it has in the recent past. But it wasn't that long ago that Belfast was plagued with sectarian violence rooted in class and religious struggles. April will mark the 20-year anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, which was the culmination of the peace process that ended this conflict known as the Troubles. My guest today is Finn Dwyer, the historian behind the Irish History Podcast. We discuss how Belfast and Northern Ireland ended up becoming separated from the rest of the island, how religious and class distinctions in the city spilled into violence, and the underlying issues that caused this turmoil to last for nearly four decades. My guest today is Finn Dwyer. He's the historian behind the Irish History Podcast. Hi, Finn. Hi, Stephanie. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I really wanted to talk to you because I feel like, first of all, I really like your podcast, and I, it really helped me when I was traveling around Ireland uh, last September and October. It's not one of the ones that I think is maybe on every person's radar that's a history podcast lover, so I want more people to know about it and listen to it. So I'm just so excited to talk to you. Great. Thanks very much. So we are talking today about the history of the city of Belfast, and I did an episode a few weeks ago about Dublin's literary pubs and the literary and political history that comes out of some of the famous Dublin pubs. And we touched a little bit about the partition of Ireland, but we didn't really talk that much about it. And so I want, and I just think it's something that maybe Americans and Canadians aren't really too up on. So that's really what I want to talk about today. So let's talk about Belfast. Um, How did it get started as a city? Well, Belfast's history is slightly different to most other cities in Ireland. Um, Belfast in the Middle Ages, the period where most Irish cities were founded, was a pretty small place. Um, it was overshadowed by the what is a town now, a place called Carrigfergus, um, throughout most of the Middle Ages. This was partly due to the fact that the Gaelic Irish tribes or clans in Ulster were more powerful than they were in other parts of the country. So the Normans who tended to um, establish Irish towns were weaker and there's lots of other local factors, but basically, I guess, Belfast was uh, slow off the mark when it came to um, developing into a city. Say Dublin was founded in 841 and quickly developed into the biggest uh, settlement in Ireland. Belfast really only took off in the 17th century. And this was um, in the aftermath of what is known as the Plantation of Ulster, when the powerful Gaelic Irish families of Ulster, primarily the O'Neill family, were dispossessed of their land and settlers from England and Scotland would have moved in. And in the centuries following that, Belfast began to emerge as a major industrial centre in Ireland and by the early 19th century. So in the decades before the famine, it had certainly emerged as the leading um, industrial centre in Ireland. Oh, wow. And it is, is it technically closer to the rest of the United Kingdom than... And not uh, politically, but just geographically. Is it closer than Dublin? Was it easier for them to come in that way? It has advantages in that Belfast is, in terms of like, as obviously Ireland is an island. So you're going to, no matter where you're talking about, you're going to be talking about a sea journey. Belfast is closer to the very north of England and to Scotland. Dublin is closer to London, um, which I guess in terms of political power uh, would be relevant But certainly during the Industrial Revolution, southern Scotland and the north of England became very important in terms of the production of certain raw materials, uh, particularly, uh, say, coal in the north of England. Um, There was 
major industry developed in southern Scotland as well, which would have been very advantageous for Belfast, which would, I guess that was a very important aspect um, in terms of its development. The, sub, the reasons why Belfast developed and Dublin didn't are, are quite complex and tied into Ireland's uh, fractious relationship with Britain, really, um, particularly an event called the Act of Union, which is generally thought to have had a huge impact on Dublin's development as an industrial centre. I guess industry is important in terms of, it might sound boring, but in terms of um, any city's development, if you don't have industry, it definitely impacts on how a city will develop. And after 1801, when Ireland was merged into the United Kingdom, Ireland ceased to have any autonomy after 1801. Um, Dublin basically went into sharp decline, whereas Belfast was better able to adjust to those changes. Part of that was uh, because Belfast had um, a longer history of industrialization and was operating on a much larger scale. What was it like during the 1800s for people in Belfast when they were... Uh, controlled by Great Britain, when the whole island was still controlled by Great Britain? Belfast, like anywhere else in Ireland, would have been a city that had uh, that was a city of extreme wealth and, ex- and a city of extreme uh, poverty. A lot of the working classes of Belfast would have suffered uh, hugely in the early 19th century. Industry tended to wax and wane rather than, uh, and I guess I suppose when we talk about recessions today, we would think of people falling, uh, becoming unemployed um, and maybe getting unemployment benefit. In the early 19th century, unemployment was a very, very scary prospect, uh, even scarier. That's not to say that it's not a terrifying prospect today. But um, in the early 19th century, it could really lead to very serious problems for a family if uh, the primary earners become unemployed because there's very little alternatives in terms of wealth or in terms of earning money. Um, but I guess... Belfast wasn't that different in terms of um, uh, in terms of the precarity in which people worked, and some of the conditions would have been absolutely atrocious. For example, trade union organising was completely illegal uh, at the time. So, if workers organised to protect or increase their rights, they could quite quickly find themselves in very serious trouble. What was perhaps even more acute in Belfast, and which is something which the city is probably become best known for was sectarian tensions between Catholics and Protestants, which have been a feature of life there, perhaps overstated in a lot of histories. But in the early 19th century, there was quite serious tension between Catholics and Protestants in the city, and particularly around um, Orange Parades. Orange Parades were events that tended to celebrate Protestant ascendancy in the city or, and in wider in Ireland as well. They were um, marked, um, they're called Orange after a man called William of Orange, um, and Mark tend to take place in July to mark uh, the victory of William of Orange at the Battle of the Boyne back in 1690. But it's very much not a well. It's related to the past. It, it has very. It has always had very serious consequences in the present. In the present, I guess we could talk later about these things in the 20th century because while sectarianism between Catholics and Protestants has been a feature of life, it's inextricably linked to issues around class as well. And I think that's really uh, when we move forward into the 20th century to understand um, the nature of um, the recent conflict in the North. Yeah, so as an outsider, yeah, I travelled around Ireland in 2016. And then I went back this year, or 2017, I went back in October. And I added Northern Ireland to my itinerary because I felt like I should go there and I wanted to see there's a UNESCO site there, um, Giant's Causeway. And I, and I did, but I, I honestly just, even though I love history and even though I've studied European history, I just didn't understand really at all why it's separate because people internally wanted it. I didn't understand how it got to be that way. It just, it's like a blank slate in my head. And so going there was really good for me to like learn a lot about it. And then studying Irish history um, since I left and and a little bit in preparation for the trip. But uh, how did it start that as Ireland is looking for independence, how did Northern Ireland and Belfast get carved off as something that was a bargaining chip? Well, I suppose, first of all, to, to, to say, do people internally want, who do they want to be aligned with? That would very much uh, differ on who you asked. Lots of people would prefer to be part of the Republic of Ireland. Lots of people would want to remain part of the United Kingdom. 
Um, where this started, certainly, I guess you can trace the modern roots or the really recent roots of this to the late 19th century, um, uh, also before, but as um, I guess after the Great Famine ended in the in the early 1850s, certainly with hindsight, we can say from that moment on, it was inevitable that Ireland was going to become, gain some form of independence. The reaction of the British Empire to the Great Famine and the fact that they their reaction largely or certainly exacerbated that crisis left many people in Ireland feeling that there was no alternative except for Ireland to become an independent country. Through the late 19th century, the movement for independence gained in uh, power um, and popularity. But at the same time, while a movement for independence emerged, you also had a movement called, which is known in Ireland as the Unionist movement or the Loyalist movement, which wanted to remain loyal to Britain and loyal to the crown in Britain. It was most powerful in Ulster, where you had the highest concentration of um, loyalists and unionists. This would have its origins back in the Ulster plantation of the 17th century. It's also linked to the fact um, that there's a huge amount of industry in and around Belfast, and it was strategically very important to uh, Britain. For example, the biggest employer, or one of the biggest employers in Belfast in the early 19th or in the early, early 20th century, was Harland and Wolf, the shipyards. They, for example, had built the Titanic in Belfast. So it gives you a sense of how important um, Belfast was in terms of the wider British economy. So um, these unionists, and certainly in Ulster, were able to gain um, a lot of support. There was also union, it should be said, though, unionism wasn't limited to Ulster by any means. It was just um, there was a higher concentration of unionists in the province or certainly in the northeast of, the, uh, in the northeast of Ulster um, compared to other parts of the country. The early 20th century proved to be um, a key period in terms of uh, the move towards Irish independence. While you had a nationalist movement emerge in the early uh, 20th century, it was demanding something called home rule, which is um, autonomy within the British Empire, but that Ireland would have its own parliament based in Dublin. This was um, opposed by a unionist movement, which did not want any autonomy. Um, there's lots of reasons why unionists in Ireland didn't want autonomy. One was that uh, unionists who tended, but not exclusively, but tended to be Protestants, felt that home rule in Ireland would be what they called Rome rule, where uh, the country would be dominated by Catholic, the majority, or polit the political uh, sphere would be dominated by Catholics who were the, do who were the majority in the country. There was also lots of other reasons. But this crisis um, became, as the 20th century wore on, the early years, it became more and more uh, fractious. For example, there was a, 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 a document called the um, Ulster Psalm Covenant, or the, Psalm, uh, the Covenant of Ulster, which was basically a pledge to fight against home rule if it was introduced in Ireland. And it was uh, said that many people signed that with their blood. The key moment, though, in, in this story is the outbreak of World War One. World War One becomes a, a initially um, is not as divisive as it would later become. Um, quite strangely, the Home Rule movement or the Irish nationalist movement looking for increased autonomy backed the British Empire um, initially, um, advocating that Irish people should go and fight. And if they fought for the empire, then the empire would, would reward Irish people by giving them increased autonomy. At the same time, um, unionists, those wanting uh, complete uh, the, those uh, wanting absolutely no change whatsoever also advocated that Irish people should go and fight for uh, the British Empire and that the British, British Empire would reward unionists by not changing anything. Now those two positions are not uh, are, are incompatible. You can't have, the British Empire can't give it increased autonomy and not give it at the same time. Um, and this was clearly teeing up a very serious conflict because both these groups of people these groups of Irish people were going out fighting for the British Army, dying in huge numbers, and both were being pro or both believed they were dying for um, very for opposing aims. The year 1916 changed all this. In 1916, Irish Republicans launched a rebellion in Dublin. Their demand was complete independence. They didn't want Home Rule. This was initially unpopular, but the reaction of the British authorities. And proved disastrous when they executed um, several people in Dublin in the aftermath of the Rising. Towards the end of the war, um, republicanism or this movement for republicanism gained in strength, particularly 
uh, when the British Army threatened to introduce conscription into Ireland. Conscription obviously would mean that uh, Irish people would then be forced to go and fight for the British Army. Now, this was very late in World War I, and you have to remember by this stage, millions of people had died in the horrors of the Western Front. No one wanted to go and fight at this stage. And because the Irish Republican movement at this stage was the people uh, arguing vociferously against this, this um, led to their growth in um, growth. Um, in 1919, a war of independence was started by the Irish Republican movement. Uh, the IRA was uh, the organisation fighting that war. But I guess uh, the country was effectively partitioned then in 1920 as a move to try and uh, take away from the um, this emerging Republican movement. They don't want even autonomy. They want full independence. And an attempt to undermine them, the British uh, government introduced home rule into Ireland. But they to try and assuage unionists, um, they introduced two parliaments, one in Dublin and one in Belfast. This was introduced under the Parliament of Ireland Act in 1920, but it was too little, too late. I get the... It was like the the, the, the phrase of the um, closing the stable door after the horse had bolted. <laughs> Most Irish or many Irish people no longer wanted autonomy within the empire. They wanted independence. Um, that parliament in Belfast, though, did meet, while the parliament in Dublin uh, didn't meet um, because the war of independence was ongoing. So the people that were in Belfast and the people that were in Northern Ireland, were they predominantly loyalists or was it just that there were more loyalists there? Like what, if you were in living in Northern Ireland at the time, what was the chances that you were a loyalist? Um, I don't have uh, exact numbers, but um, it was more likely, yes, unquestionably more likely um, than it was uh, in, it depended on where you were. Like there was like, so depending on the time, there would have been uh, large numbers of loyalists or unionists in Dublin, for example. Um, um, not majority, by any means. Um, but, you know, Dublin was... Um, from like A good example might be from the early 20th century, Dublin's Lord Mayor was nearly always a um, nationalist. Okay. Um, which, I guess, is a reflection of the change. But at the same time, when British monarchs came to Ireland in... 19, Queen Victoria came in... I think it was the last visit was in 1901. So in rural areas in the, in the south, um, there was um, less support for unionism. But I guess the big concentration of it, the big uh, the centre, you could call it Belfast be, being the, uh, as the, the centre of uh, unionism in Ireland. As, um, but it wasn't in any way exclusive to Belfast or Ulster. It's kind of a, a fact forgotten in the later 20th century that there was unionism across the entire island. So when Northern Ireland is partitioned off, yeah. what is the immediate reaction in Northern Ireland and in the rest of Ireland? I guess the background, the War of Independence lasts between 1919 and the summer of 1921. Um, the war uh, ends in a truce initially with... Uh, the IRA and the British Army agreeing that there'll be uh, negotiations. While the IRA had achieved quite, um, ha or had quite impressive achievements, it, it probably was clear they weren't going to be able to win this war. Um, the British Army were um, struggling to maintain control in huge parts of the country, but at the same time, the IRA were struggling to deliver any kind of a death blow. Um, and negotiations took place in Britain in London uh, in the latter month of 1921, resulting in the famous Anglo-Irish Treaty. This was brought back and uh, voted on in a parliament in Dublin. Now, part of that treaty was that Ulster, or sorry, the uh, six counties of Ulster, Ulster is comprised of nine counties, and the six counties of Ulster would, be, remain, would remain part of the United Kingdom and the rest of the country would be called the Irish Free State, um, but largely speaking, was independent. Um, this provoked um, huge tension pretty much across 
the island or certainly within the Republican movement who had fought for that war. So some argued that this was the best deal that uh, Irish people were going to get at the time and that they could potentially work for um, a better solution further down the road. But in 1921-22, there was no hope of uh, getting full independence Many people, the majority of people in the IRA at the time, were not happy with this treaty. They wanted a full, they wanted to continue the war against Britain, and in the south, in in the, the southern twenty six counties, which became the Irish Free State, this led to a civil war that would drag on into nineteen twenty three, a, a civil war that was a, a very brutal affair. In 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 the north, in Ulster, is would have had less of an impact in terms of there was huge, huge conflict in Ulster, something that's generally forgotten about. But um, lots of Catholics, for example, were attacked in the aftermath of that treaty. There was huge numbers of people who actually left uh, Ulster and um, fleeing to the south. But in terms, when I say huge conflict, it's more of a social conflict, I guess you could describe it as very serious. People are killed in large numbers um, through the 1920s. Um, but nothing compared to uh, what was going on in um, in the south, where there was a, a full-scale war fought over several months. Um, that would have ended in a victory for the pro-treaty side who advocated um, a limited form of independence and partition. Um, and they emerged victorious in 1923. They fought that war in a very, very brutal fashion. Um, the... Um, they carried out what would generally be called as um, war crimes today, in particularly in uh, Munster. But um, it came to an end one way, one way or another. It came to an end in a victory for that uh, for the uh, Free State government in the summer of 1923, and then Ireland in 26 counties in the south, then known then as the Free State, um, went their own way essentially. And then in 1949, declared themselves completely, indep- or completely d- independent as the Republic of Ireland. So for Northern Ireland, they've got internal turmoil. How, how, do, how do those 25 years work there? Are they more incorporated into the United Kingdom? Or are th- do things kind of stay the same compared to how they had been with their parliament before the split? Essentially... I guess in terms of the grand scheme of things, I'm not saying things don't change, but in the grand scheme of things, life in the North doesn't change. That doesn't mean it's good. Um, I just mean that like, it's not, it doesn't go through what you might consider the changes that happen in the South in terms of um, the development of the, of, of the free state. I guess what's really important though, in terms of the dynamic that develops later in the 20th century is that in to one degree or another, um, the North, is essentially an uh, an apartheid state where Catholics are discriminated against because of their religion. And this becomes very important in the late 1960s because this becomes the uh, key uh, mover in the development of um, what's known as the Troubles or the recent conflict in the North. The Irish Republican Army who had fought the War of Independence um, remained active but on a very, very small scale through the 1920s, 30s, through the 1940s, into the 50s, they would have carried out actions, but nothing that was in any way um, a threat to the, uh, to the British presence in the north of Ireland. And then um, what became the key factor was in the late 1960s, inspired by civil rights movements across, um, particularly in, in, obviously in America, Catholics in the North began to organise for better rights um, because they were basically being discriminated against. There was huge unemployment. um, They couldn't get jobs. And they began to demand better rights. There was a a process called gerrymandering, which went on as well, which meant that although theoretically the North of Ireland was a democracy or Northern Ireland was a democracy, in effect, it meant that um, uh, Catholics were largely disenfranchised. Because of the way the districts were drawn, yes, so exactly. That, okay, so the way yeah, that we have we have serious problems with gerrymandering gerrymandering in America right now. So uh, different yeah, outcomes, but yeah, where you concentrate huge numbers of people into the one constituency to limit their influence. So we're we're getting into the time period that uh, is known as the Troubles, and I think that yeah. 
so I was, I was born in the eighties and I think that partially the reason that I say that a lot on my show is that things that happened in the sixties, seventies and eighties are like right before I remember them. So they're not really the past, but they're not in my memory. And I feel like those are the things that I have the biggest gaps on. And so learning about the troubles was like shocking to me because I realized so much of this had taken place during my actual lifetime. It was just outside of what I was aware of. And so it's interesting. So this is it's, this is starting in the 50s it's and 60s. It's growing out of the way that the state is being run post the partition and um, the creation of Ireland, the Irish Free State. Is Are these things happening in Northern Ireland also happening in the rest of England? Or are there just so few Catholics that, not the rest of England, but the rest of the United Kingdom? Or is this only happening in Northern Ireland it's not. It's not that there's so few Catholics. It's the re, it's the way Catholics are being treated in the nor, in in Northern Ireland, which is the difference. There's Catholics all over England and Scotland and Wales, and they are a minority. But it's not as an important thing. This is, I guess, this is what I referred to earlier uh, in relation to class, because essentially, and these aren't exclusive. But if you're a Catholic in Northern Ireland, in the say. In the, 19, in the early 1960s, you are more likely to be poor. Um, and of those who are wealthy, lots of them are Protestants. Okay. Now, you have class divisions in society that overlap with, with religious differences, and that is a very explosive mix. But it should be realised that those religious differences have been there for four or five hundred years, four hundred years by this point. What becomes the key thing is this class issue where huge numbers of people are being disenfranchised. Uh, they can't get houses. They can't get jobs. Poverty is like absolutely endemic in cities like Derry. And that leads to a civil rights movement. Uh, the British Army cracked down on that. Um, for example, you probably, you may have heard of Bloody Sunday where uh, civil rights marchers were shot. At the same time, the IRA is starting to become more active or large numbers of people want to resist the British Army, um, leading to large numbers of people joining the IRA. Um, and quickly the conflict does become uh, militarised, leaving very little space for uh, what you might call civil disobedience, which had been um, a bigger part of politics in the late 1960s. Um, the Republican movement, or the IRA, uh, splits famously between the provisionals and the officials. The officials become... Um, a Marxist organization, the Provisionals become a more militaristic organization. Uh, for your listeners, if you know, if you've heard of the IRA, you're going to talk about, or uh, if you've heard of the IRA, you are talking about uh, the Provisional IRA. Even though there was the official IRA as well, the, the one you will have heard of is the Provisional IRA. They're essentially the group who are one side of that conflict. There are lots of other small paramilitaries, for example, um, Groups like the INLA, uh, as I said, the official IRA, they go on a ceasefire very early on and don't really participate that much in conflict and in, in military conflict in the north. I guess what has become probably a what's becoming more and more clear, which is an interesting, well, it's a very a dark aspect of this, is the fact that um, the British state were running, I suppose, informers on both sides of this conflict right from the earliest days and had a huge influence over some of the worst atrocities. It seems likely now, due to the recent um, research is indicating that they had, um, for example, a huge, uh, like, and this was largely suspected, but not necessarily, there's more evidence coming out of this, that they were running essentially death squads, um, loyalist death squads in the 1990s, which carried out some of the worst atrocities of the Troubles. While that said, the, the troubles, while they were largely influenced by, um, or while one of the main drivers underneath, which sparked off, were class tensions. It, it, you can never get away, though, from sectarianism. Um, and some of the worst atrocities that were carried out were undoubtedly sectarian in nature. For example, the IRA massacre at Kings Mills, where essentially huge or large, or I can't remember exactly, I think it was 10 individuals were killed just because they were Protestants. Catholics were killed just because they were Catholics. But by and large, I do think um, to understand that conflict, it is very important to understand the kind of socioeconomic background to the groups 
or to the various different communities um, in the lead up to it. While this was happening, did this have any spillover into um, the nation of Ireland or was this really contained within Northern Ireland? The Troubles definitely had a huge impact in the Republic of Ireland. Sorry, initially, the government took a very hard line stance compared to their later stance, where they even at one point were almost posturing um, about getting involved directly. And this was probably never going to happen, just given that Ireland would never be able to fight a war against Britain. But uh, certainly there was huge, certainly at the start, when people saw uh, television footage, for example, of uh, Bloody Sunday and the British Army attacking crowds, um, people in the South were outraged. This, however, was contained as the conflict developed through what has often been called Ulsterization, where it was like this idea that it was just tribal violence in the North between two groups of people that just always hated each other, which allowed the conflict to be kind of almost contained, if you will, as a problem of Ulster. Um, however, that said, um, large numbers of people uh, from the South um, would have been involved in the Republican movement and um, would have joined the IRA, would have been involved active in the north and would have served time in prisons both in the, in the republic of ireland and in northern ireland and in england um, the um dublin was attacked by unionists um in the famous or infamous dublin monaghan bombings when uh, um when two car bombs were exploded killing several people um but by and large, it is like I think it would be. It w- I wouldn't like to portray that people in the Republic of Ireland were in any way equally affected. Um, it was um, many people in the Republic um, almost tried to distance themselves and almost, you could say, pretended it wasn't going on. Um, they would obviously see about it on the news every night, but it was almost like. It, um, it was happening in, a, in another world. Um, and it's something you would hear quite a lot from people in Northern Ireland, that uh, this, this um, feeling that they were um, abandoned by people uh, in the Republic. What were the aims of the two sides? What, like, so I know that, so we talked about that the, a lot of the causes were Catholic repression, but what what were the actual political outcomes that each side wanted? The Republican movement wanted full independence, so that the uh, that would involve the six counties joining the Republic of Ireland, and um, so that the island of Ireland would be one political entity independent of Britain. Um, they, they're. Um, and I will go back, I did reference that sectarian attacks were undoubtedly carried out by Republican paramilitaries throughout the Troubles. Um, theoretically, Republicans and Irish Republicans, which are very, very different from um, US Republicans, it should be bare born in <laughs> mind. Yes. Uh, um, Irish Republicans also, theoretically at least, um, claimed that religion should have no involvement in politics, that uh, unionists and Protestants were Irish people and they had as much right to live in this uh, 32 county island of Ireland that would be independent of Britain. The Unionists um, wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom and wanted to remain, basically wanted to maintain the status quo. Um, They also, uh, there were very small groups that kind of would have kind of been in between the two, but they were largely, it must be said, uh, um, irrelevant to a degree. There, there were, um, I suppose, what you might call constitutional nationalists um, who would have been influential in the early stages of what became the pre- peace process. But um, I do think when history is written of this period, it will see the provisional IRA on one hand as being one of the major players, unions, paramilitaries on the other, and the British state on the other. And the Irish state would have played its role too. So what was the international, like outside of the United Kingdom and outside of Ireland, what was the international response to this situation? Generally speaking, and this is a very generalized comment, um, it would have been um, the Republican movement who would have had the strongest international links um, 
they allied themselves or aligned themselves with independence movements all across the world. And it's probably worth bearing in mind, this is when this started, this is the 1960s and 1970s. So, for example, the Irish Republican movement would ally, would have aligned itself with um, um, Arab nationalists who were trying to gain independence at that stage, <coughs> Palestinians, um, various groups in South, in South America, um so in terms of international support, oh, and I suppose most famously, the IRA would have had strong connections with the ANC, uh, the African National Con- Congress, who um, were opposed to apartheid in South Africa. Um, they were, that was probably their most famous uh, international connection, maybe. Certainly uh, in terms of uh, loyalism or unionism, wouldn't have had as many uh, international supporters. I suppose you might say it's not... Like, you don't, it was a very inward-looking ideology. What was the, did the Catholic Church have an official response? Um, Catholic Church would have been opposed, sorry, the Catholic Church would have been opposed to violence. Um, generally speaking, it would have, um, like in current terms of the Troubles, it would have, it would have been completely opposed to the Republican movement and always was. How did so? The when does the violence peak, and how does it start to, like, how does a peace process start? Well, it's a, a, a very complex question. Um, <laughs> Generally speaking, there are several key moments. Probably a very significant moment is in, in 1981, and um, uh, ten IRA hunger strikers died in prison, um, and this proved to be a seminal moment. Um, it provoked outrage around the world and the Republican movement grew massively in Ireland because of this outrage. It was seen as um, incredibly callous that the British government had effectively allowed these people to die. By the early 90s, the British army were starting to wage a very, very uh, brutal war against the IRA. They were operating what has been come to know, what, what is known as a shoot to kill policy, where they were actually killing people on site, not arresting them. Loyalist paramilitaries at the same time were carrying out um, were a, what, what might be regarded as attacking the base of the Republican movement by increasing numbers of quite indiscriminate attacks against Catholics. Um, and you kind of, the reason I'm saying this is a, in, in reference, or the reason why I'm bringing this up in terms of the Republican movement is because obviously the key issue in terms of any peace process would need to involve the provisional IRA. And, well, I, th- I would imagine the IRA w- or the provisional IRA and, say, Sinn Féin today, their political, the provisional, I should say, the provisional, um, the provisional IRA don't exist anymore, theoretically at least. But they would deny this, but effectively they were forced to the negotiating table. Um, there was two IRA ceasefires in the 1990s. And then this led to, um, there was an, an initial ceasefire, then talks began and broke down. And then a second ceasefire, the, the one that, Blasted began in 1997, and then uh, the following year of 1998, there was um, what's known as the Good Friday Agreement, or its official title is the Belfast Agreement, which um, basically ended the conflict. The IRA committed to decommissioning and lots of other um, conditions about bringing the war to an end. They, they that led to some minor splits within the Republican movement. There have been some killings, obviously, continuously since then but nothing compared to pre-1997 levels. So the peace process, the papers were signed 20 years ago. And and now Belfast is a fun city. Like, it's a fun, modern city. I, I enjoyed my time there immensely, I think. Um, how did it go from ending this internationally recognized conflict to kind of where it is today? Like, how did... How did the politics and the culture shift so dramatically? Once conflict stops, it obviously allows other opportunities. That's not to say that all problems have gone away, and that they certainly haven't. And sectarianism is definitely still a problem. And critics of the Belfast Agreement or the Good Friday Agreement um, outlined this at the time, that it was kind of enshrining, part of the problem is that it kind of enshrines sectarianism because in the system of power sharing, you have to have unionists and it, it, it's not it's not kind of a normal elections. You have 
a government comprised of unionists and nationalists or unionists and republicans or whatever you want to call them but from both sides and a kind of enshrined sectarianism and i don't think sectarian tensions have completely they certainly have uh, sectarian tensions haven't gone away that said things are obviously far better than they were 20 25 years ago and you're right like unquestionably that belfast is a very different place than it was 25 years ago i, I don't know if i actually i find that question quite hard to, to answer other than to say <laughs> When the war ends, things improve. But, no, uh, I think that that was perfect. And, and um, so how do you think that the political situation between Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom, and Ireland is today? Um, do you think we're in a status quo where things can reasonably stay like this for decades or centuries? Or do you feel like things are still shifting? The last two years have probably changed a lot of people's opinions on this. Um, Two or three years ago, I think a lot of people would have said that we have reached a certain point where, um, say, for example, Ireland uh, and Britain are in the European Union. So essentially, the, the more the European Union grows and deepens its kind of roots in European society, that like the border becomes less of an issue and maybe there will be a border, maybe there won't be a border. But at some point, it has almost become irrelevant because the European Union is, is kind of growing or whatever. Not everyone. I'm not saying everyone thought that, but I think there was a, a, a strand of thought. And then, but then uh, Brexit happened. And that really changed people's um, opinions um, on this issue um, when Brexit happened because suddenly a Britain was going to be outside the European um Britain was going to be outside the European Union again. There's all talks now, for example, of a hard border, which would create huge problems of trade between the Republic and Northern Ireland. And just so listeners understand right now, I don't know. I I didn't even realize until I got there, like literally. So my first day in Northern Ireland, I flew into Belfast, drove to a hotel in Ireland, drove back the next day to uh, the Atrium Coast and never crossed a border it's literally one highway system and that's what is the soft border that you're talking about and now because of brexit that might not be possible to stay yeah like there's lots of other issues around this that for example like it's generally thought that brexit will be a disaster well (laughs) there's lots of people in britain who don't think it'll be a disaster but i think a lot of people do think there's a high likelihood that brexit will not work out favorably for example, a really simple thing is that people in Northern Ireland will no longer have European passports, um, meaning that, well, they, they, we do not have European passports, but they won't be able to travel within the EU because they'll be, um, because um, they won't be obviously EU citizens. This has led, for example, unionists, some prominent unionists have gotten Irish passports, which they're entitled to. But also lots of people feel that there will be increased support for United Ireland um, as a result of Brexit because if, for example, the economy goes downhill and people feel that if the North or if Northern Ireland was to join the Republic, that it would get the advantages of being in the European Union, that that could potentially destabilise things again. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm just saying that the people do feel that this is a, a renewed possibility that could emerge from Brexit that people are no longer, I guess, five, ten years ago, it didn't. It was very difficult to envisage a different scenario. And then suddenly Britain was talking, or Britain voted to leave the European Union in a move that very few people saw coming. Everyone thought that that referendum would be relatively easily passed by, um, by or sorry, everyone thought that that, uh, that referendum would never pass. And then uh, suddenly it did, and it's created all these issues about how, like a lot of this stuff hasn't been figured out. And I think that's what's really worrying people is that no one knows what the answers to these things are. And if there is a hard border, it's just going to become a point of tension. For example, there are small uh, paramilitary groups. Obviously, if there's British soldiers on a border between the Republic and Northern Ireland, they're going to become a target uh, for uh, Republican groups who may not be able to um, attack uh, anything else um, but I think the biggest impact which no one is certain about at the moment is what way it will influence um, public opinion in Northern Ireland 
certainly, I don't think now anyone wants anything to change. Sorry, can you just cut that out? Yeah. Um, certainly, I think uh, at the moment, or sorry, pr- certainly previous to Brexit, um, there was little demand for any major change in terms of uh, joining the Republic of Ireland. Not that, but that certain like not that people didn't necessarily want maybe. Not you know, nationalists obviously would want it, but they weren't like demanding it um, as a something to happen straight away. And now all I'm saying that Brexit has thrown up is maybe an unknown factor now. I'm not saying I'm not saying it will definitely lead to United Ireland or anything like that, but it's certainly throwing up this unknown factor into the situation, which definitely was not uh, known but have seen or like before Brexit happened to whatever that was two years ago, and because it's. Um, it's being handled so badly. Um, negotiations are not going very well. The British government don't seem to really know what they're doing. They're talking about replacing the uh, current British government with a more hardline British government. All these factors create uncertainty about what is going to happen in, in Northern Ireland after Brexit goes through. That is a lot of interesting, somewhat, some of it depressing, but some of it interesting things to think about. Uh, between Brexit and the 2016 American election, the world is a very different place than I think we thought it was going to be, unfortunately. Sure. Um, so thank you so much, first of all. That has been incredibly interesting. And I really hope that anybody who wants to dig further into Irish history, go check out uh, your show. Where can people find you? Um, I guess the easiest place to find it is on iTunes. Uh, which is just Irish History Podcast on iTunes. Uh, I'm also on Spotify, Irish History Podcast. Or you can go to my website, irishhistorypodcast.ie. And if you're coming to Dublin, I have uh, tours in the city. On the I'm launching a new tour around St. Patrick's Day on the Great Famine in Dublin. So you can find out more about that on irishhistorypodcast.ie. Get a new site built. So if you log on the next couple of days, it might not be uh, looking too great. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And um, if yeah, if listeners go to Dublin, they should definitely one. If you know you're going to go to Dublin, download all of the episodes of his show and listen to all of them before you get there. And then to reach out, and that would be a really interesting tour. So that's that's really cool. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, you and I have talked about maybe you coming on again down the road to talk more about the famine. So thank you so much. Sure. Great. Great. Thanks very much, Stephanie. I want to say thank you again to Finn for coming on the show. If you're considering visiting the Emerald Isle, or if you want to know more about Irish history, definitely check out his podcast, the Irish History Podcast. You can get it wherever you're listening to this podcast. And for housekeeping, I am now in week four of my five-week trip around the Iberian Peninsula. When this episode drops, I will be on a road trip around Portugal to get out into the country and see some of the UNESCO sites that are not in the main cities. If you want to see pictures from my trip or get updates uh, as I'm going, go to my Facebook page or Instagram account. And there I'm History Fangirl on both. And um, I try to post, I post on Instagram uh, stories like an insane fiend. I think I only took one day off in the last 10. I've been kind of bad about posting pictures on the regular feed, but I'm trying. So uh, yeah, check those out. And then um, if you haven't left a review, it would be great if you would leave a review and rating on the podcast app of your choice. And thanks for listening.